welcome to Fame Community Forum 8, where Sally Samuels and Tom Netting will discuss the latest updates from Ed on COVID-19, the new DL promissory note, and the challenges of returning to campus. Take it away, Sally. Thank you very much. Um, just a reminder, we've got the housekeeping tips and everything in the presentation that haven't changed. But I just want to remind you that this information is fluid. It changes daily, and FAME is doing its best to keep you informed. And today's guidance could be different even next week. Actually, it could be different even half an hour from now. But hopefully, it's not going to change that quickly. Um, you already know who I am. I'm Sally Samuels, and with me is Tom Netting. And we're going to try to give you a few updates today. So, Tom, I'm going to let you go ahead and talk about some new information we received just moments ago and also uh, yesterday. Well, that's what I was about to say, Sally. It changes by the minute these days, it would appear. Um, a couple of things to kind of bring fame, uh, mem fame members up to date on new information, new guidance that we have, and the anticipation of additional information yet to come before the end of the week. Uh, as I believe many of you will start to see flying into your inboxes even as we speak, the U.S. Department of Education about an hour ago, hour and a half ago, uh, released the final version of the regulations on Title IX, the long-awaited final rule that has been outstanding for now literally over almost a year and a half. We anticipated that the department would actually publish that in its final form prior to the November uh, 2008, excuse me, 2019 deadline for it to go into effect this July. Well, obviously, they missed that timeline, but now they have actually published the final regulation, 2,033 pages of light reading uh, that we will all get to go through in the not-too-distant future that starts to redefine the manner in which Violence Against Women Act and a number of the issues related to campus security, the investigations into um, any, any form of allegations and the responsibilities of the Title IX coordinators in the institution uh, are all updated in this new regulation. So it'll take some time, as you might imagine, for us as well as the community to get through the, all of those pages and all of the responses. You will recall, or I hope most of you will recall, that this particular uh, notice of proposed rulemaking, when it was introduced, got the largest number of responses in terms of feedback that the department had never received. Whereas the high watermark for issues important to us, like gainful employment in 9010, were around 90,000 comments, this particular document in its NPRM form received over 230,000 comments. So I anticipate that a great deal of those 2,033 pages are going to be, sorry about that, are going to be information that relates to information that relates to specific areas around response from the department to all of those many, many comments. In addition to that, uh, we had the opportunity uh, yesterday to, uh, I had the opportunity to share some time with Principal Deputy Undersecretary Diane Howard Jones and also the individuals that are the leaderships of most of the accrediting commissions that are responsible for uh, our oversight in terms of participation in the federal student financial aid programs. And I got a couple of takeaways that I'll share. I'll be happy to share with the FAME membership. First and foremost, Diane Howard Jones, one of the questions that I've been getting a lot lately is one of fundamentally, are, is the department going to extend the timeline for the utilization of the guidance that they provided? We're thinking all the way back to the March 5th, March 20th, and April 3rd guidance on how institutions and students are to handle the disruption and the interruption in training. Remember, we're now literally sitting here at May 6th, and a lot of this started back March 5th, two months ago now. Um, but one of the things that she said was that the guidance that were provided in that March 20th and then reaffirmed and established in greater detail in the April 3rd update stated that the flexibilities provided in all three of those documents and the FAQs that have come out as well was for students enrolled from the period of March 5th through to June 1. Well, we're coming up on June 1. Institutions are having to plan for their futures, and June 1 is not that far away. And people were worried and concerned legitimately as to whether or not that time frame would be extended. While Diane did not give the exact amount of time, 
that the extension was going to be granted by the department. She definitively clarified that, in fact, the department, in guidance to be published yet this week, would extend that for, quote, a considerable amount of time, unquote. Don't ask me if that means till August 1st or December 31st. I don't know. But uh, the way in which she seemed to answer the question and the manner in which she addressed the issue seems to indicate that the department is going to give a considerable amount of additional time. That means some other things are coming out in terms of guidance as well. By her intimating that that guidance would come out, she elaborated on the fact that in addition to the extension, that the department would address a number of the issues that they didn't address in those three preceding documents and all of the corresponding FAQs. She specifically highlighted a number of them that are very, very important to our community. Satisfactory academic progress, financial responsibility, return of Title IV funds, leave of absences, and the list goes on and on and on. So I believe that a great deal of information that we can use and that we've been waiting for will come out in the publications yet to come, I hear tomorrow or likely on Friday afternoon, as the department is sometime wanting to do. On the call yesterday, Diane answered one of the questions, as well as the June 1st question, that I think is very important for all of us, and one that I know that I have been asking in the community, has been asking for quite some time, as it relates to leave of absences. With regard to leave of absences, we have all asked questions regarding whether or not the HERF funds, the Higher Education Emergency Relief Funds, HERF, we live in the world of acronyms, has, is eligible, uh, students that are on leave of absence are eligible to utilize the student portion of those funds, the Emergency Financial Aid Grant Assistance to Students. We weren't clear. We didn't have an answer. There were differences of opinion between attorneys, differences of opinion and in information provided by a number of the national organizations, including NASFA versus other groups. I'm happy to tell you that the final answer was, it depends, but here's what it depends upon. Diane said unequivocally that an individual who is on a LOA prior to the, the announcement of the national emergency is not eligible for the HERF funds. But any individual that was placed on a leave of absence as a result of COVID-19 and disruptions in their education as a result of COVID-19 are eligible to receive the Title IV, excuse me, the emergency funds that they're eligible for in addition to your, where, where, where they stand with their other financing. It is important to remember, however, that those students must meet all of the other criterion that are part of the guidance and the regulations that and electronic announcements that have come out thus far. It does mean that you have to be able to show that they either have received financial aid or are eligible to receive financial aid under Section 484 of the Higher Education Act, meaning you can show their immigration documents, their Social Security number, if they are, in fact, individuals that are male, uh, whether or not they're, they've uh, registered for, for the draft, and a number of other issues that you all are well aware of. You also have to make sure that those individuals meet the rest of the criteria that are out there as well meaning that they are enrolled or were enrolled, are enrolled, but on a leave of absence from a program that had at least a hybrid or a bricks and mortar component. Individual students who are totally online are ineligible for the student HERF funds and similarly being placed on a leave of absence and fully on, uh, online would not be eligible as well. So you have to make sure of the devil of the details, but she did make that clarification as well. Two other takeaways that I had was that the department is very, very acutely aware that timing matters right now. They are doing, as we've shared on previous uh, FAME presentations, they are very, very much aware that they have the responsibility, as Congress expects and as the students expect and others expect, to get this money flowing and to get it out to the students as well as to the institutions. When you're talking about both sides of her funding, and they're doing their very best to try and get the guidance to go along with all of that information out. Diane acknowledged the fact that there still continue to be frustrations and problems with the application process under grants.gov. I can share with you that one of the reasons for that is that there are now continued questions around whether 1098Ts need to be associated with each individual student to track those additional grant assistance funds, emergency grant assistance funds, for each of the individuals. That was not something that the department was anticipating and has to look at how that 
if in fact is something that IRS wins and the department loses in terms of the discussions that are going on right now, how that is integrated into their current system infrastructure, whether that be G5, COD, or the like, to track and make sure that that information is tied to the students. Last but certainly not least, Diane intimated that given all of the transition that has occurred to online education and all of its various different modalities, but she anticipates that as time goes forward, these opportunities for institutions to temporarily dip their toes into the water of online education may be a tipping point for more institutions to look to do hybrid models in the future or come up with other ways in which uh, they're more comfortable with the utilization of technology and different modalities in, in, in cooperation with bricks and mortar, hence the hybrid notion, recognizing once again that not all programs are capable of being taught all online, coming back full circle to the reason for the, uh, the discussion that we were in yesterday, which was around the complications, problems that ensue from programs that have experiential learning requirements as part of their licensure and certification requirements and therefore need the tactic, actual hands-on work environment types of programs. Last but certainly not least, she reminded individuals that in the near term, that probably means that there's going to be time once we transition back to the ability for students on those LOAs to go back into education that again, it might have to be some kind of hybrid, some type of recognition that maybe the licensing and certification requirements are loosened to allow for apprenticeships or allow for work study where the individual has completed their theory and completed for the vast, the vast majority of their education, but for the ability to then complete apprenticeships or the clinical practicum internship, externship, and that that might bring even more collaboration between the educators and the institution, the individual student, and their collective community on the back end. So a lot of good information came out of it. Uh, the accreditors, the major takeaways there were that, yes, we're seeing a silver lining of potential more of an understanding and appreciation for what technology and distance education have to offer for all types of educational programs, but a very clear indication that a quick transition in the interest of preserving continued eligibility and access for students based on the pandemic is far different from the way they would look to view the actual utilization of full standards, full guidance, and full implementation of programs if we weren't in an emergency environment. So a clear indication that, again, integrity of course content, delivery, and the assessment on the back end uh, are going to be important components that if institutions were to look to keep this, sometime in the future uh, are going to be necessary. So Sally, that's probably um, a little bit more than what you were expecting, but uh, again, information is coming out fast and furious. That's a good thing, and we're here to try and prevent, present it to you as, as timely and accurately as we can. That was great, Tom, but I really am disappointed that you couldn't give me a good overview of that thousand pages in that hour. You mean 2033? I'll get right yeah, on that. Well, I cut it in half. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, temporary distance education. We already know where we're at with that. We've been doing it for a while, unless you remain closed, which in that case, uh, you probably at this point are really struggling to figure out when and how you're going to reopen. If you're doing temporary distance education, just some reminders that, again, until we get more guidance, this is temporary approval. and. Um, the accreditors were allowed to waive those great detailed requirements for doing online training. They haven't even evaluated what you're doing. So remember, if we get to do some type of a hybrid for a while longer, or the accrediting agencies are able to fast track a um, endeavor for us, it may not be quite as easy as you're doing now. And right now, I think you're thinking this is a great thing. You're able to do online. It works well for your students. It's flexible. It also has all the downsides, as any online school can tell you. Uh, attendance is not great. Um, dropouts are huge in online programs. So, you know, even though it could be a light at the end of the tunnel, it could be a train coming the other way. So just keep that in mind. 
uh, again, it mentioned in the guidance originally only the current payment period, and then they added the next payment period. So again, you're back to that second payment period that could be the problem. Your students have to be at least half time. In a clock hour environment, if you're in a state that's only allowing you to do 10 hours a week, you're in half time attendance. So when the student gets to the second payment period, they're not eligible for Keller loans. And remember, if you're a term based, they could be eligible for less than half time, but not eligible for loans, just for Pell. So there's a lot of reasons to uh, probably transition back as soon as possible for some of these students. And that's what we're going to try to talk a little bit about today. Uh, and, Sally, if I, and Sally, if I may, that was also, there were a number of issues around the temporary distance education requirements that were brought up. Dr. Mirando, in particular, the 50% cap on the ability to have online training and the fact that a number of institutions are going to very quickly, especially now with depending on the length of your program, required by your states or limited by your states, that could impact exceeding or brush, brushing up on that 50% rule. And he shared that with the department in the desire and the hopes that once again, where flexibility can be offered, that that flexibility will be given. I think the department has made it very clear in previous uh, documents that they can't really adjust some of these requirements in terms of program length, but are, or can only go so far in program length and contact hours and the like. But where there is flexibility, they're trying to provide some. And certainly on behalf of the large number of FAME members that are cosmetology in nature that have tried to transition to online, Dr. Miranda, as well as others, were reminding the department that there are some issues there that hopefully can be addressed. Absolutely. Thanks, Tom. Okay, so let's talk about going back to the classroom. Uh, I would say number one you have to do is go to OSHA and look at the guidance on preparing workplaces for COVID-19. First and above all, OSHA requirements are going to have to be followed regardless when you're a business, a school, whatever the situation. Uh, you're also going to have to follow state and accrediting requirements and actually it goes beyond that because even though you have state requirements, you're going to have county and districts that are going to have different rules on when you can reopen, what you have to do, what the numbers in a place can be. I, I actually went for blood work the other day. The total numbers allowed inside of the lab, which is a fairly decent sized lab, was 10, including the employees. So we were going in there three people at a time to get blood work done. And that's going to be true in many, many situations. Um, Remember, please, you currently cannot teach a hybrid class unless you went through the whole normal accredited and state procedures. So when you're doing this temporary, unless the Department of Education comes back and says you can transition part of the students at a time and do a hybrid, and you get state and accrediting approval to do that also, you're going to be stuck either doing classroom or doing your temporary distance education. And once they say that small businesses can open up, such as salons and, and uh, places like that, if your school fits into that category, you may have to go ahead and open at that time. So we're going to have to, to read what comes out carefully, make sure we're following whatever's there, um, and, and making sure we're, we're following all of those exceptions state by state accrediting, go to your accreditor websites, go to your state guidelines, go to your areas, listen to what they're telling you out there. I know it's pretty hard to avoid it because we hear it 24-7, but still. Uh, also, plan and organize your workspace. This may be a huge undertaking for you. Um, I've been in many of your schools, and some of you have minimal space. You know, if you're just starting off and only have uh, a few employees, and those employees also our instructors and do other things and you only have a two or three classroom school, uh, it's going to be pretty hard to plan and organize that workspace and keep the distances required. Um, you need to have that pretty well planned out before you even walk through the doors. You know, where can you put people? How many people can you have in that area? Can you do the social distancing that's required? 
all of those things have to be taken into consideration. Um, and then I say the next thing you need to do is before you open your class, whether it's a Zoom meeting or whether it's actually at the school, but I think you need to review what your plan is, what the protocols are, everything that has to be done, what everybody's rules are, and there are no exceptions to these rules because obviously you're talking about safety here. You have to practice a new protocol. Maybe have your instructors go in or, or your teachers go in or whatever, and you kind of practice on each other. Be in the classroom. Review what has to be done. Uh, get in the habit of remembering to wipe everything down every single time anything's touched. That's going to be a whole new learning for everybody, not just, you know, your students. Everybody's going to have to learn that new protocol. And then maybe do a student orientation uh, with the COVID-19 requirements for the school, what's required, reminders of how far apart they have to stand when they're clocking in, um, who wipes down the, the time clocks if you have them. Something's got to be done between every single student touching anything. Uh, you could try temperatures at the door. There's a lot of uh, the infrared thermometers out there, forehead thermometers or whatever. Uh, if you feel that that's necessary and it may be a requirement, we're going to have to wait and see what's required by the state, what's required by the, the industry, what OSHA requires for your particular type of business. Uh, remind everybody to stay home if they're sick. I mean, we've all gone to work with a little cold, with the sniffles, an upset stomach, you know. I love right fever because we're so dedicated, we want to get things done and we want to be there. It's a whole new world out there. If somebody is sick and there's any chance that they could have the virus, they're going to have to stay home. And this isn't just when you reopen. I think we're talking about a long, long time here, months maybe even years until the vaccine's out there. Uh, at least vaccine is in trials here in the U.S., and hopefully they can get some out there and, and you know, it will help. But right now, we don't know what the future is going to be. Is this going to be the new norm? Who knows? Uh, six feet between students and instructors and everybody at all times. Uh, like I mentioned, clean the time clocks, clean any surface they touch, sanitize all services before and after each class. Stagger your schedules. Maybe you're now going to have to run a uh, uh, shorter day, maybe four hours a day instead of six or eight, and run three classes a day so that you can get the students all covered because they can't all be there at one time. Again, the face masks are going to be required for everybody, your instructors, your students, anybody that's there. You're, you're, if you have any type of a clinic or um, you, you have a mechanics shop and, and they bring their cars in. Those people, everybody has to wear a face mask to protect each other. If you have laboratories, uh, instructors and students have to wear face masks or face shields in there, depending on what they're doing. Maybe if you're doing blood draws, you're going to require face shields. I don't know. Um, whatever safety precautions have to be done. Again, cleaning all surfaces is going to be a mantra. Everything we say is going to be clean and clean and clean and disinfect and disinfect. Uh, any instruments used have to be sterilized before and after use. And uh, maybe you have to use disposable gloves for everything. Um, be sure whatever you discard, it's in a closed container so that if there's any germs on it, it can't get released. Um, it's scary when you stop and think about what we're going to have to do. Uh, the clinic shop floors uh, maintain social distancing. If you're Cosmo, Barbarine, Manicurist, can you put some type of divider between work areas? And, um, you know, maybe manicurists and, and hairdressers may have to wear face shields so that because when they're leaning over somebody to help protect them. I, I just don't know the answer. These are all suggestions. I did take some of this information from Georgia guidelines for going back to work actually in the uh, in uh, salons and tattoos and places like that. They haven't ever figured out how tattoo parlors wind up in the same category as some of the others, but they do. Um, using hand sanitizers, again, having hand sanitizers all the way around. Every place you look, you've got a little pump so that people can walk, get their hands clean. Disinfectant wipes. Uh, disinfecting everything in between clients, customers. Again, the face mask will be on every single page. 
your restrooms. I mean, you've always cleaned and disinfected your restrooms. Well, maybe not disinfected. You probably should have. But now you have to clean and disinfect all restroom surfaces, including the floors, sinks, toilet bowls. You may have to have um, a cleaning service there more than once a day or whoever's in charge of cleaning the restrooms. It may be something you have to do hourly to make sure that things don't get spread. Uh, make sure all your paper products or anything that's disposable is in a closed cabinet so it can't get exposed to anything else. Provide antibacterial soap. Place trash cans by the door so that they can go ahead and when they're, when they're ready to go out the door, the, after they wipe the handle off, the uh, items can be thrown in the trash can. Remove anything that doesn't have to be in your restrooms. We're, we're great for putting little magazines in there, flowers in there, nice paintings on the wall that could be fabric just to make that area a little more pleasant. Um, potpourri. Uh, I don't think you want to have anything that could have the virus living on it in your restroom. So again, it's cleaning everything and getting rid of everything. Maybe we've had too much in there and it's time to purge it a little bit. So if you have time clocks, um, again, whatever you're using, if you're using the vein reader, that's going to have to be clean because people put their hand right on it. Uh, the thumbprint, um, if you're using I don't think many of you are, but if anybody's still using the old standard time cards, uh, those are touched, stored someplace, and they be wiped off. Do you need to consider doing something else with your time clocks? Your break rooms. Um, you know, students go in there, the teachers go in there, they may have their own lounges. Uh, what are you doing with those rooms? Now, if you have breaks staggered and students can go in and there whenever they want, they're going to have to be responsible for making sure that that area is cleaned up and disinfected wherever they've sat, um, spacing in there so that they're not sitting on top of each other. Uh, if there's microwaves and other things in there, making sure all those surfaces are cleaned in between anybody using them. Shampoo bowls, pedicure bowls obviously are for salons, uh, schools that have their clinic services. Um, and there's procedures for all of those. Same with treatment rooms. You know, you've got people bending over, people doing uh, uh, face massages, body massages. I mean, what are you going to do to control all this? And then you have to have administrative controls. The administrator has to set down a set of rules and then make sure they can be enforced. Is it going to take, like, somebody walking around all the time? To, it's just in charge of COVID-19 compliance. That's another whole area of compliance that we shouldn't have to think about or worry about. But I think it happens now and we don't have any choices. Uh, most any place that has a business, whether it's a, a business, a salon, um, the school itself, has a reception area. So if you have a reception area and you're interviewing students, I think a lot of you are probably going to go to online interviews as much as possible. Uh, you can do virtual tours with your students. Then if they actually physically come to a reception area to, to start school, they have to come in and meet with somebody before they know where to go, whether it's student, student orientation or anything else. So be sure you remove all unnecessary items such as magazines, newspapers, service menus, anything else out of there, and all decor that's not necessary or could um, carry the virus on it. I would be more concerned about anything, paper that's not confined or, or whatever. Um, if you're going to publish anything in its paper, I would probably put it in some type of a sealed um, container, whether you, you go ahead and, and run it through a machine and have it sealed or whatever and so that it can be wiped off. So those surfaces can be wiped off because people have a tendency to touch things. We're touchy-feely people and we do touch everything. So wipe down all seats and tables, cloth chairs that can't be properly cleaned and disinfected, maybe use plastic covering over them or maybe consider eliminating the use of them during this period. Um, wipe reception desks with disinfectant all the time all the time. Anybody that's in there touches anything, it needs to be disinfected. Consider discontinuing continuing use of anything that's paper, such as paper appointment books, 
um, any type of cards you're using, go with electronic options. And if any of you still have a library with magazines, newspapers, anything like that in it, I would consider going electronic for everything in your library if possible. The least you can expose to people, the better off you're going to be. Employees should frequently wash their hands, just like they're currently hopefully doing at home. But they have to do it after using phones, computers, cash registers, credit card machines. In addition, all of those items have to be wiped off frequently. Um, whether you're using static wipes, disinfectant wipes, whatever you can use for your electronics. And then in addition, um, you know, cash registers, credit card machines. It's nice if you have a credit card machine that the employees don't have to touch and the student can just slip the card into the card reader and pull it back out and so that there's no uh, passing of those credit cards back and forth between the staff and the students. Consider not accepting cash if you've got any type of a clinic where you're accepting money or if the students want to come in and pay you. Um, we're not sure how long the disease can live on cash, but cash is pretty dirty. It gets moved from person to person to person. And uh, now that you've got a virus out there, Lord only knows who it gets moved to. I swear to God, I have been a cash person all of my life. I, I don't use my debit card on a regular basis. I don't use um, my credit cards to pay for anything, even though I know you can build points and use it for other things. Uh, I've always paid for my groceries in cash. Just, you know, I'm older and it's old habit. Not anymore. Not anymore. I don't want to hand cash to anybody. I don't want them handling cash back to me. So if possible, try to avoid those cash transactions. Um, try to go to credit and debit transactions where you don't, where you can use like a touch. A lot of the new credit cards are touched, so you don't have to sign. But all the technology doesn't necessarily uh, recognize it, so you might still have to go through that. But if you can consider doing anything where you don't have to sign, if you give somebody a pen or a pencil for any reason, and you take that back, you need to disinfect it. Maybe put it in a dirty bin and then set up a new bin for clean things. Um, wipe off all your door handles, all your surfaces, all your doors that are regularly touched by clients, staff with disinfectant wipes. Uh, restrict, restrict handling your products. Um, I know, again, I said we're all touchy-feely and a lot of times you're trying to sell a product to somebody and they want to pick it up and hold it and read the label, etc. If you're going to allow that, you're going to have to clean that product afterwards because, again, it's been handled. Unless you require them to wear gloves, and again, remember, wearing gloves does not protect you because what happens is you wear gloves, you touch something, then you touch something else. Those gloves actually can transmit disease unless you change gloves all the time. And I don't think most of you can change gloves 50 or 60 times a day. It depends on what you're doing. But just restrict, you know, handling those products if possible or Make sure that they're wiped off and cleaned if it's something you can wipe off. Uh, provide hand sanitizers, tissues for everybody at the school or your facility. Um, if you do have a clinic area, salon area, uh, some things they're suggesting depending on different states. I've tried to go to read some different state requirements. Some of them are pretty consistent, some are not, but uh, temperature checks seems to be a wise thing to do. You can even do it for your students, not just the instructors, uh, or not just the um, salon for your uh, clients, because you don't want a sick student waiting on somebody, or a sick instructor teaching a class, and you don't want somebody that is sick coming into the clinic floor. So you want to be sure that you can do temperature checks if, if that's what your state recommends, your accrediting recommends, whatever. Um, Everybody can ask health questions before you set up an appointment, even if it's to see a student for the student to start their first day of class. It can be a form they sign. You can collect the forms. Or if you're talking to them over the phone, you can ask the questions and then, again, have them sign off when they come in there. Um, they did that with the doctor's office when I called to set up my appointment. They asked me the questions over the phone. I had to complete a form once I got there. It's a pain, but, you know, that's... 
the wave of the future, unfortunately. Um, it might be wise to do services by appointment only and not allow walk-ins, at least until we get over this major pandemic or until we get back into the school system to see how things are working out. Um, so either online appointments or by phone would be the probably the more um, safe route to go. Uh, again, everybody's going to use face masks. Um, either limit who waits in the waiting room or restrict it. I noticed that some of the states are having people wait in their cars or wait space six feet apart outside, and they call them in one at a time when the um, person that's going to do their work is ready for them so that their appointment is set, but they can't go inside or they can't uh, conjugate, you know, so maybe a reception area will hold three or four people comfortably at six feet apart. But you might have 10 people that can work on clients. So you might have to have some of them outside. Um, that works okay if you're in places like Florida, except now today, again, it's going to be 93 and it's been pretty hot down here. So they don't want to have to sit outside too long if there's no shade. Um, you also don't want to have to sit uh, out too long if you're in a state that's recently had a snowstorm like Michigan. So we're going to have to just see what works. I mean, some people don't have cars. They get to you by bus or they walk. So um, that's all things to consider. Uh, just some suggestions for personal protective gear. These were salon suggestions. I actually took most of this from Georgia. So those are things they suggest, some of the things we've already mentioned. Um, disinfecting, you're supposed to use EPA disinfectants only that are registered and labeled. Uh, I guess you can do a solution of Clorox. Go on the website, find out what the state or um, accrediting is going to allow you to use in that state, depending on what you're doing and what you're trying to disinfect. Uh, if you've got tools, obviously you're going to immerse the tools. Um, you're going to have to be sure this stuff is mixed daily because it's not supposed to sit, and you're going to have to replace it every day. You can't just let it sit for any length of time. Uh, clean all your surfaces with hot soapy water, which will actually remove a lot of things. But then you have to go ahead and do the disinfecting on top of that if you can do it. And remember, some surfaces can't be disinfected, so they can only be used once and discarded. The uh, cardboard files, the buffers, so like nail files, you may only be able to use once. Drill bits, uh, I guess if there are things that can't be re um, disinfected, and I'm not familiar with a lot of those tools, so I'm just hoping this makes sense at this point. Uh, remember to launder all linen. So before, if you used a towel grate, uh, you always wash that. But if you use smocks, I, I know smocks don't always get changed between clients. They should be, but they're not always changed. They have to be washed in hot soapy water, dried completely at the warmest temperature allowed. Uh, depending on the material, and stored in an airtight cabinet. So maybe they were on a shelf that was open before. Now they have to be in an airtight cabinet in some states. Um, the mask is going to be mandatory. And then they, some of them were suggestion that if you're doing, uh, like you're washing somebody's hair, that you put a face towel over the client as you lean over them to wash their, their hair. Um, so I don't know which way you're going to do things or what your state's going to require, but it's certainly going to be a new way of doing everything at the school. So um, we do have some next-gen information. Tom, do you want to talk about this or do you want me to? I'm going to take myself off on mute. Uh, why don't you go ahead and then I'll fill in anything else that I have to share. Okay. So or, do you need, or do you need to take a deep breath? No, I'm okay. You know me. I can talk. I know. So can I. But go ahead and I'll fill in. <laughs> I'm like you. Okay. So the next gen FSA uh, APIS has been updated, and it just was updated recently. It has some new features. One of the new features is the uh, annual student loan acknowledgement, which was going to be required April of this year. That has been postponed to April 20. 
uh, one, one is now going to be available in this new application and people could use it, but they'll at least be able to see what it looks like. Uh, they have added a feedback center and a status tracking center. So like before you had the feedback, back, you could enter something that kind of went into Never Never Land. So now they have a status tracking center that knows what you put in there and they're tracking that to make improvements to the uh, app that's out there. We also have some new updates to studentaid.gov, uh, the loan simulator enhancements out there so that you can uh, go in and play with that, see what's going on. The master promissory note has been updated and it is now in there. Uh, you can still use the old note till December 2020, but the new one has been updated and it's in there with anything that has to be put into place. Um, they've done some FSA ID enhancements so the student um, has easier access to the FSA websites and to get the information. And there's a notification center in there that continues to give you more updated information. Anything you want to add, Tom? Yes, yeah, Sally, two things real quick. The uh, department has noted that even though the old, the, the old master to promissory note is still in effect and can be utilized till 2020, you, I hope you agree with me, they are encouraging schools to transition earlier if they so choose. Uh, so that's something that I hear from a number of my department colleagues that I talk to. And the other thing that's not public, but I can share with you because they gave me permission to, many of you were in attendance, as were Sally and I, at the department's annual SFA conference in Reno back in December, where one of the major new advances that they were talking about at that time was a beta test for NextGen where on the smartphones and the other access devices for the front-facing student side, they were doing a beta on the ability for students to make their payments directly to a portion of the, the lending community, the servicing community that holds their loans. Uh, that beta test has gone very well, according to department officials, and over the course of the first quarter of this year. So they are looking to expand and move that forward as uh, time goes, goes forward. It's one of the things that they had hoped they would be spending more time before any of us knew about the pandemic and certainly all of what that has brought to the department in terms of all hands on deck and working through the new guidance and all of the changes that have come about as a result of the pandemic and the disruptions. But I can tell you, and I was allowed to share, that the department does anticipate that the ability for students to go to all of their servicers, which was the original intent, is something they're continuing to move towards and believe that that is something that is attainable before the end of this year. And they think that it is uh, will do uh, good things in terms of, excuse me, working with students to do repayments when we return to the, to the point at which students are no longer uh, on uh, automatic forbearance and not and having to repay their loans. So they made it, the, the the beta was going very very well up into the point where it ended because of COVID nineteen. But as they repick that up on the back end, it looks like they will have even more of the servicers involved and they intend to see that through to fruition. That, that's really great news, Tom, because I know at the FSA conference there was a huge concern of the community that this was another thing the Department of Ed was going to have control over and they were really concerned Anxious. Yeah. that it would fall through the cracks and, and not pan out as they expected it to. And again, I kind of forget that a lot of the schools or some schools might still be doing a paper prom note. I think if they go into um, you know, the direct loan to complete the master prom note, the new one's going to pop up. So that transition should kind of automatically happen for at least most of the schools we work with. Fair enough. Okay, so we have um, a few other announcements. Uh, May 1st, they did the 2020 annual DUNS number registration. So, many of you already found out your DUNS number was wrong. And this is something that every single year they do the annual DUNS number registration and ask you to go in and update your DUNS number and do anything you have to do. And it's always been something they've encouraged but not a true requirement. I think now all of you are... It became more relevant this year, didn't it, Sally? 
That's right. It was as long as your information was correct on your e-car, everybody got their money and it was a wonderful world. So now you need to remember the importance and hopefully we will never have anything like this again where you'll have to actually access that. But please remember when you get some type of a reminder, go out there and do it. The other reminder that went out a while ago was to remember to update your SIP codes. I am willing to bet we have some schools out there that because there was a lot of things going on, trying to let that slide through the cracks. So, and there are some important changes to those numbers. So uh, a number of the areas within disciplines within our communities have been modified. And I don't think everybody's caught on to that fact yet. Right. So you need to be sure that you go in and make sure those DUNS numbers are, are correct. Uh, and make sure that your SIP codes are correct. And that's something that whenever you're required to do that, you need to go ahead and pay attention. We send you reminders. Department of Ed sends you reminders. They put the electronic announcements out there. Um, remember, electronic announcements are your responsibility to pay attention to. OK, enough of that. Uh, we did get cohort default rate time extended to June 30th. So that's a good thing. Don't let it fall through the cracks just because it's been extended. Don't wait to the last day to try to get it sent in if you want to um, challenge any of those cohort default rates. And they, they did say something about the Federal Work Study Community Service expenditure requirements, that they did waive the 7% community service requirement for 19, 20, and 2021 award years. So that is uh, something in the past you've had to go in and ask for. And this is going to be an automatic. And then the other part of that, obviously, is America Reads. You do not have to do one student in the project of America Reads, basically because we're not sure students can out, get out there and do the community service or do the American Reads right now and when those uh, things would be available to you. So uh, there are other things about federal work study. But uh, next week... Didn't they waive the institutional matching portion as well? They did. I, I don't think... Uh, yes, I forgot to bring that up, Tom. Thank you. They did waive the institutional matching portion. So remember, that's the institutional matching portion that you may have been doing for your students working in community service or working at the schools. But if the student is working for a private pay, so say I have... Uh, um, I'm working toward a degree in technology, and I went to work as a part-time federal work study student in the IT field, and that employer was paying the wages because you can use a small percent of that for that type of uh, industry. Remember, those are not waived. It's just these right. And I want to give you one other reminder before we go to anything else. I don't. Yeah. Before we go to anything else, one reminder, if you're using FAME's financial aid services, uh, just a reminder that I know many of you are still looking for money. Remember, once you get that um, notice from FAMES with the award number, you have to forward that to FAME and also tell us what bank account want the money to go into because when we order those funds we have to designate a bank account so you do your ticket to customer support you attach that GANS notice that has the award number in it we can then go in and order the funds and then we have to send an email to uh, P5 to tell them which account those funds are supposed to go into, and we're doing those mass emails on a regular basis. So that was just a remind, reminder. Um, I don't have anything else right now, and we did finish a little early today. So, Tom, do you have any suggestions, anything else you want to add? Um, a couple of questions in anticipation of what uh, Crystal and others might uh, be asking as well. Uh, if you are experiencing delays with your HERP funds, uh, do not be alarmed. That IRS circumstance that I alluded to is slowing down the process for the department to complete the uh, the recognition and the awarding, the grant award, uh, and the last process of going through GANs for your student side. Um, yes, some institutions have received 
portions of their funds, yes, that is providing complications for those schools that have, if they have multiple campuses, because of the inability to commingle those funds, it's making it so literally you can have, for the sake of simplicity, a main and a branch campus, the main got their funding, the branch doesn't, and you've got students at one institution getting their financing starting to be dispersed, and the other institution not. You've got FSA literally putting forth postings to all students, once again, through the front-facing front platform of studentaid.gov, saying to contact your offices, you could be eligible for financing. So we recognize, and the department recognizes, that that is a frustration and complication. But in anticipation of the questions, yes, some schools have gotten their funds. Some schools are withholding their funds, even though they have them, and even though the department is pushing uh, out information that encourages students to go to their institution to seek those funds until they get all of their funding at once so that, again, there's no discrimination or a perception of that type of, in, of discrimination. Very few, if any, schools am I aware of right now that have gotten their institutional portion, and that is because the group that is responsible for all this is focusing on trying to get all of the student funding, clear up those conversations and concerns that I alluded to between IRS and the department, and get all the student funding financing out before moving on to the institutional side. So that is another one of the reasons that there is a holdup on your receipt of your institutional sides of the funds. The department made clear on several different occasions, including most recently in conversations with me yesterday, that schools have the ability to utilize their funds for appropriate issues with regard to the disruption and for, the, for them to then be reimbursed once they receive their funds. The devil in the deep blue sea there is a lot of entities they're aware don't have this store of cash in order to be able to do that, and they recognize that the funds need to be forthcoming, and they truly are working uh, to the best of their ability as quick as they can. Uh, so I anticipate that might be some of the questions that would that have been asked. So I just tried to bring up those, but I'll turn it back over to you and Crystal for questions and our ability, Sally, to try and answer them. The the other thing with that, Tom, is you remember Diane also said that, and and I heard her eighty percent of the schools had gotten their money, but on the student side. But she also said that many many schools had not yet applied. I'm not correct. And to remind everybody that they should be applying. And um, I think part of the delay is obviously the whole DUNS number, SAM registration problems. But I think some of them have just decided to wait. And then she also mentioned that, you know, G5 is overloaded. Correct. It's overloaded. <laughs> With everybody. They're not, they're not equipped for this. Yeah. Yeah, it just wasn't equipped, and, and, you know, like anything else, they don't go ahead and, and tell anybody how to do anything. I also saw, Tom, yesterday that there was, uh, the OIG said that there was a discussion, I think maybe today even, in NASFA about the OIG having over uh, $7 million to spend on monitoring the PERP funds and how the Department of Education is... Uh, well, I reminded people on various, well, and as part of our Q&As and as part of the, the information that I'll be sharing with Fame, um, I've compiled uh, the list of questions from all the various webinars I've attended, and we'll be sharing that information. Sally, you've seen a little bit of the advance of that, uh, but we'll be providing an update of that and questions for everybody. It's, it's written right into the statute. All of these discussions, two weeks ago there were media articles and a back and forth between the proprietary community and some of our detractors once again when one of the National Trade Associations put out information just reminding people that, quote, folks were going to be watching. Um, that, you know, the, some of our contrarians use that to try and speak ill of our community and say, see, they know that we're watching, and so that's the way that they're signaling that we have to, you know, that that's code for the fact that we just need to be careful of how we predatorily do these practices. It was a bunch of BS, to be quite honest. I go back to the very simple uh, reminder that, yes, there are $7 million written right into the CARES Act, right into the HERF section. It's section 18007, where $7 million has been granted for the review and the of the utilization 
of all of the higher education stabilization funds. So that includes the portions of the proceeds, some 14 plus billion dollars that went to elementary and secondary, 14 plus billion that went to higher ed, not only for the HER funds for all, student, all eligible Title IV eligible institutions to participate, but those other sections for Title III, Title V, and Title VII, HBCUs, minority serving institutions, and tribals that got an additional forward version of, addition of, of monies as well. What I think is going to be incumbent upon our community and others is to monitor while doing our job effectively and within compliance what other portions of the higher education community are doing. Interestingly enough, there's already been a published article in the Chronicle about a major university in the state of Michigan that is utilizing their funds in ways that don't seem to be in compliance with the statute, literally putting out an incentive that if you join for the summer semester, you would be put at the front of the line for access to emergency heat hurt funds. That is oh. totally, totally wrong. And you might see a letter from a certain congressman who used to work in our community from the state of Michigan to that institution and to local media saying, you better keep an eye on everybody, folks, not just the proprietary sector. I'm sure. I'm sure. That's amazing. I digress. So, so Tom, suppose we have a school that doesn't want any funds. Do we know how to tell the Department of Ed they don't want them? Uh, it's, yes, it's very simple. All you have to do if you are selecting or choosing not to access your funds uh, is let your regional uh, contact, your regional Department of Ed contact know. It's a, an email similar to what they've encouraged them to do if you are going to return portions of your funds. Uh, just notify the department that you are choosing not to, uh, and they will hold on to those funds and redisperse them and reallocate them going forward. Okay, good, because I do have a couple of schools that were closed and obviously won't be able to use the institutional portion, um, or we don't think they'd be able to use the institutional portion. I was going to say, don't say that yet, Sally, because that, that has not been definitively determined. I, yeah. I'm, I'm not trying to be flippant. Um, you know, there are still disruptions, and please don't say closures. One of the things the department has remind, reminded me is they aren't officially closed. What they have done is temporarily cease operations, or the word they're using is cessation, uh, which is written into a number of their regs uh, in terms of the responses you see. Okay. Until they officially close, the department doesn't prefer that that term not be utilized, because close comes with it all the requirements to do a closure, all of the regulatory requirements, and then if it were to reopen, all of the requirements that then come to try and become re-eligible. A school that is temporarily suspended operations due to COVID can stay in that status until they choose to close or reopen. And there is some questioning about whether or not, once we get some of the guidance that I think will be forthcoming yet this week on how the institutional portion of funds can be utilized, may be the saving grace for things like payroll or rent or other things to keep the entity at least in hold, in limbo or form of operations until they can return to operations if they so choose. I did remind them that they could move that money over to grant money for the students also. And all the money can go to the grants for the students as well. Again, as long as it meets the same requirements as the requirements on the, the, the side of the um, certification and agreement that they sign for the student portion of the funds. Right. Okay, well, I don't think I have anything else, so let's open it up to questions, Crystal. Okay, great. Thank you, Tom and Sally. You're welcome. All right. Did so, we get the questions I answered, Crystal? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we did, like, uh, towards the bottom here. We have quite a few questions. Um, I'm going to start at the top here. So how soon after successfully completing the CARE Act application for the student portion can a school apply for the institutional? Immediately. As long as you executed is the wording utilized by the department, as soon as you have fully executed your submission for the student side, you can submit your separate application for the, the institutional cost uh, aid side. Perfect. Thank you. 
Next question. We have a student who was supposed to return from LOA, but when we went to distance learning, she had to have her LOA extended because of technical issues and uh, practical learning. Is she eligible for the HER funds? Okay. Based on... Yesterday, I don't think so. Well, <laughs> if the extension is still within the 180-day frame and she was willing to come back but couldn't, um, I think you have to very, very heavily document those circumstances and ask. But, you know, Diane said that if you can tie this to disruptions based upon COVID, that those were the individuals that were eligible. And I would hope that you could, if an individual was on that LOA prior to, was trying to come back but can't and have the LOA extended as a result, Sally, I think you can make the case that that then is capable of being utilized. Wouldn't you have to know whether or not the school was offering temporary distance ed? Because Probably. Because if temporary distance ed, then the student could come back. Right, but if, it, but if they're, again, but if it's a, a circumstance where the LOA is being extended because it requires simulation or actual placement, external placement, experiential learning, and that's the reason for the extension beyond, then under those circumstances, I think the answer is yes. Okay. I would heavily document it. I would ask the department. See, we don't even agree all the time. That's all right. It's good for discussion. And again, I would remind everybody, let's wait and see what they actually put in writing uh, that comes out in the next day or two, because that might provide uh, additional clarity for these type of nuanced questions and answers. Thank you. So our next question, what do we do if the loan period ends and the second student loan payment was not received? I, I guess yeah. it's a, yeah, I think it's a, if it's a FANG processing client, go back to send a ticket in to customer service and we'll look into it. Uh, the, the money should have come in. Yeah. You know, unless the school didn't do something to let us know that the student was eligible in some way. So, right. uh, you know, if it's a FAME client, I, I think it needs to go back to uh, customer support and we'll look into it. Okay, great, thank you. Next question, we just got approved for online education. Can you please let me know what is the minimum hours a part-time student can do per week in Florida? And also, I would like to know if we need to follow the schedule that they sign in the contract. That one's pretty open. I don't know if it's term-based, credit hour, not term, clock hour. Uh, the amount of time they can do online is, depending on the program and what the state allows. Um, state of Florida, I believe they can go quite a few hours a week now, even if they're clock hour. But again, it's going to depend on the program, I think. But I think we've got a lot of flexibility here in Florida. So now you go back to accrediting, et cetera. If your clock hour, the minimum to receive aid is 12 hours a week. That's, that's pretty much the bottom line on it because that's half time. If your credit hour uh, for loans, it's six hours a term, six credits a term, whether it's semester, trimester, quarter, it doesn't matter. And uh, if it's less than six credits, it would be um, eligible for Pell but not for loans in the term. So it's all going to depend on how you function. And if you need more information, if you want to send me an email, my email is at the end. I'll respond to you individually. Thank you. Are new students entitled to HERF? And when do they need to have been enrolled by? New students are eligible as long as they are individuals who have requirements and needs based on disruptions related to COVID. It still has to be that those individuals have situations, circumstances, and needs that arise as a result of COVID. Not everybody gets this just simply because they're students at the institution. They have to have had disruptions in their education. That's a clear area where the students that were enrolled at the time of the announcement of the pandemic are given a leg up, if you will, versus students that are coming into enrollment 
in periods that begin after the notification of the pandemic. But they are still eligible for it if for circumstances, circumstances that arise that would be similar to the other students, an individual within their family, a spouse, or others come down with the, with the, with the, with the, the virus, have to be sequestered. The individual has to be sequestered. There are circumstances uh, in terms of other areas that would necessitate that things related to cost of attendance other than tuition that are needed to go to the students are provided. Sally agreed? I agree. Another one might be that you have to stay home with the kids because of uh, COVID-19 and the schools aren't open. And the school systems, yep. Yeah, there are a number of, there are, you know, again, that's where these become somewhat tricky because, again, you have to relate it back to disruptions, the word that they use in all of the statute and all of the department's guidance for either expenses related to the cost of, of, of uh, the disruption of the education or instruction, that's for the students, or cost associated with the transition as a result of the pandemic for institutions. Those are the definers that you have to look at everything through in context. Thank you. Next question. Now that federal work study is auto waived on the 7%, are we able to move our funds into FSEOG? Um, we have been waiting for the approval, but it sounds like that is unnecessary at this point. That's correct. You can move the funds. And you can move SEOG funds within themselves from uh, around as well. That guidance was given as well. Right. So you just notify FAME that you want to move those funds. If a student needs money as a result of COVID to buy a laptop to continue with their education, can her funds be used for that? Absolutely. Yes. And you can do one of two things. If the student needs that funds, that is under course material and technology, which is a related cost of attendance where their funds that you give them directly could be utilized for that. Or if, let's say, the institution after March 5th, or excuse me, March 13th, purchase laptops for all of their students or access to Comcast or some other network provider to ensure that there was access to the internet and the capabilities for individuals to utilize technology to continue their education that the institution purchased and either gave to the students or uh, gave and are going to ask back for, the institution can utilize their institutional reimbursement uh, for those funds as well. Great, thank you. Has there been any conversation with DOE about allowing schools to offer temporary hybrid education, even if it's only for a short period of time? Go ahead. Isn't that essentially what they have now? No, no, right now they're doing everything online. No, there are some schools that I'm aware of that are doing a hybrid. Uh, they can't do a hybrid right now. A temporary distance education is strictly online for those schools that were brick and mortar before. They can't have classrooms at the school and do temporary distance education. Um, unless already approved for a hybrid before. Let me read well, that. Because it said only for a short period of time to launch school openings. And, and the answer to that is that's one of the things Diane addressed yesterday. Oh, okay. Hoping that they, they're looking at that to see if they can accommodate that. Thank you. Is there any... Did I or did I confuse okay. you? I, 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 no, you, the, the, the disclaimers are there that, that were needed, but I still believe that you can do both. Again, especially if part of what you're doing is the transition that is enabling you to get from point A to point B? Um, I don't think so, but we'll check into it further. I, I know schools that are doing it and had approval. We'll check into it, but another one of the ones where we we, uh, we got to seek clarification. None of these are easy answers. Any R2T4 news? 
only that we should have an answer, some clarification, and some new guidance from the department on that by the end of the week, according to the principal deputy undersecretary. Thanks. One of the others did give FAME some guidance that they got from Ed, I'm, but I don't have it in front of me. But it did sound like at this point you're supposed to hold that money, do the R2T4 calculation, not make the refund, hold that money until we have further clarification on what happens after that. Yeah, that's, isn't that one, another one of the biggies, Sally, is because yes. this will result in Title IV credit balances, because you still have to do the state and institutional refund policies, you'll have the R2T4 credit, the credit balances, and how do you deal with that with cash management and all the other requirements that haven't been waived, right? Absolutely. Does the institutional match only apply to students' earnings on and after the school closure? Yes, I don't believe you can go, well, it's not closure, but after the school, um, either Transition. Like suspended class or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the institutional match, you can't go back, I think it said. I think it said it was from then forward that they didn't have to make an institutional match. Yeah, it doesn't. It's it's the it's the same guidance for all portions of the flexibility that right. were offered. But. Can you award SEOG while the institution is closed? Well, again, it's suspended class, so it's not closed. So technically, the students are on a on an LOA until the school reopens. Um, and SEOG and Pell can be awarded, just not. Uh, loans. Loans. Okay. Can a school use the HERF institution portion to award non-Title IV students with the emergency relief funds? No. No. Okay. What do you think the best practice for distribution of student HERF funds? One or two disbursements, EFC, length of program considerations? I don't have a clue. I think you have to look at your student population and make your own decisions. I mean, there are schools out there that, that every single student's hurting, obviously, because of either loss of employment, parents lost income. Uh, there, there's a, a lot of factors out there, and unless you can do some type of a form and ask every student, single student what their current situation is, I think it's difficult. So either you can base it on your best knowledge of what the whole community is like or do some type of rationale. Um, we don't have any guidelines on that, except it's supposed to be based on students that were affected. So I guess if you knew somebody still had their job and they weren't affected in any way, that everybody had, you know, if you had to go online, I mean, even here, my internet goes out off and on because of uh, so many people using it. So there's, there's, I'm sure everybody could justify something. That's why I know a lot of schools are just dividing it equally. And again, I think it depends on your volume. If you're a volume with four or 5,000 students, you have to make a decision. If you're a, a school with 50 students, a lot of those schools are just saying, it's easiest for me because I don't know everybody's individual circumstance and everybody I know has need because I'm basically a fully Pell eligible school. They're just basically. Some people are doing um, need based on EFCs, but that doesn't mean it means current need. And are having to have the counseling sessions to determine what chances might have changed those needs. Right. Sally's right. I mean, there are as many different ways to do this. And when I said you can't, you know, the notion of just giving it out to all students, you can give a portion of it out to all students, but what do you do for when the circumstances change? What do you do when the circumstances haven't even arisen yet, but change sometime while is that enrolled student that was enrolled during the, the, the announcement and forward, all of a sudden has circumstances that arise that they didn't have before? A number of the institutions are therefore putting aside portions of the institutional funds potentially to accommodate for those things, or even holding back some of their uh, of the student funds to accommodate those type of circumstances as well. 
But this all comes back to the institution seek, seeks guidance from their counsel, from excellent groups like FAME and others, in order to make your determination. What I think I've heard clearly from the department officials time and time again is, as long as you're doing what's in the, the best interest to assist the students, that's a pretty good starting point for anything you do after that. Document, 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 and show that the, the correlation or the connection to COVID, and you should be fine. Another thing Diane did say yesterday and has been intimated to me by other department officials, the department's taking some time with getting some of this guidance out for very clear reasons. They want to make sure that they put this out in ways in which can be defensible three to five years from now, as well as today, tomorrow, and next week, so that when audits or program reviews come up sometime in the future that look back on this very unique, unprecedented, and challenging times, that the interpretations of the day are taken into account and protect you from interpretations that could be different when we're well outside of being in the now and in the moment. Is that fair, Sally? I think it's very fair, Tom. In addition, you know, like right now, when the letters came out from uh, Ed, they basically said, you know, to expend the funds as soon as possible. Now they're saying maybe you shouldn't expend them right away until we give you more guidance. So it's a little, a little murky out there. So I think you do the best job you can and you document what you've done and why you did it. And to that end, another thing that everybody should keep in mind, you have a full year from the time at which you signed and submitted your certification to expand the funds, student funds as well as institutional funds. So while the department realize, we re realize and appreciate, and you certainly are experiencing as institutions, the need and the desire from the students, I think some degree of patience and prudence right now will serve you well over a much longer time horizon. So sharing with the students the fact that you're working on it and if you haven't come fully fully vetted and fully determined what your plan is going to be and again whether you do one disbursement or two that's a decision left up to the institutions and there are people doing it a lot of different ways and what the classifications are and how um, you know, circumstances are, are determined but need base should kind of enter into that I would submit because the secretary in the letter to institutions, as well as on every one of their announcements, has said that they do anticipate and do recognize that they believe individuals with need should have some recognition or, you know, she even talked about individuals with need could have, should have the potential access up to amounts equal to the Pell Grant. So you can see that their mind truly does, they, the department, is still looking at this in terms of classifications around financial aid and what drives those assessments. Now, obviously, the times are different. And as Sally talked about, the department is acknowledged, and you know firsthand, when they filled out the FAFSA, their need and the definition of what comprised EFC could be entirely different than the circumstance they're faced with sure. that changed over the course of the last two months or could change next week. Yeah, that need was two years ago. Right. I, I really think people need to think about this a little bit and, and, you know, again, try to think about what you can do. Ideally, some type of questionnaire would help you make decisions, but do you want to hold off that long? I'm not sure. Um, and again, you know, we don't know how long this is going to last. Are we going to have another wave in September? We certainly hope not, but we don't know. You know, think about this. Let, let's, let's, let's play a hypothetical role play. If what Diane said and intimated yesterday, that the June 1 deadline is now extended till December 31st, that's going to make a considerable difference in how much money schools might want to hold back and how many students potentially could be subject to the utilization of some portion of these funds. Right, Sally? So yeah, it could, I mean, so it could totally change your whole structure. Whatever. Could totally change your whole structure and even your methodology of what you were going to disperse and how you were going to disperse it. I agree. And we don't know. That's what we love about financial aid. We never know what we're doing. 
and you, I hope you hear the empathy in our voice with that. We, we, I'd love to give you a, a concrete answer, but there's just too much ambiguity and too many variables, some of which we continue to bring up and learn about as we go through, all of us collectively go through, and, you know, the department's trying to go through all of those permutations, too. I, I always say, Tom, I've been doing this 40 years, and just when I think I know what I'm doing, I don't. I never know what I'm doing. I just make it up as I go along. <laughs> All right. Um, next question. To be clear, G5 will be the place to draw down the HER funds, or is FAME acting as an intermediary funds distributor to its clients? My understanding as of this morning is that if you send the ticket to customer support and you put in there the award ID, you know, that, that acknowledgement with the award ID, and designate where the funds go, they would draw the funds. We always would have drawn the funds, but before we were telling you, you had to go in to um, go in and, and uh, get the award letter. Now we can get the actual award letter, but we need that award letter ID that's a letter that comes to you. So we can actually do everything. You don't have to go into G5 yourself. Thank you, Sally. Next question. Are FSEOG requirements um, now waived like in terms of awarding? For example, if a student doesn't have a zero EOC, can they be awarded immediately? You never had to award zero EFCs only. It was always based on need, and need was not by EFC, <laughs> even though technically it kind of was. So um, you've always been able to award non uh, Pell eligible students even, as long as you've done your awarding and you've done your students in the order that you said that you were going to award. So however you said you were going to look at, like I always suggest you use four deadlines, you know, like a deadline each quarter and you look at all your students in that period and everything that is eligible um, with a Pell eligible EFC is eligible for funds. And then you do your next group. So if you have say, all those students in that first group, and you still had money left over based on how you divided your money up, you could go to the next group then and give them to non-Pell eligible students. So they don't necessarily have to be Pell eligible, but the Pell eligible students have to be awarded first. Thank you. How would you recommend documenting citizenship status and valid social security numbers for out-of-pocket students to determine if they could follow FAFSA? I'd make them file. That's the easiest. Mm -hmm. You don't know if the name social security number matches unless they do a, a match to the FAFSA. Selected service you can check on. You can check to see if they have an acknowledgement. Um, you can check and see if they're at fault. But the, but the social security mismatch it's pretty hard unless you've gone in and, and filed a FAFSA. So I just think it's cleanest and easiest if the student files a FAFSA. They know in a day or two. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. How about FSEOG match? Does the school still have to match? No. Great. Okay. We got to a lot of questions today. That's good. Um, how will students have to classify these funds once awarded for tax purposes? Don't have a clue. That's what we're <laughs> waiting to see. <laughs> Do you agree, Tom? You see me smiling on the screen. This is one of those areas where um, you know the department, again, trying to move forward and do what they were tasked to do, move forward, made decisions, only to have the IRS come in and intervene afterwards and say, well, wait a minute, we might want this tracked on 1098Ts. That is literally a discussion that is ongoing between the department and the IRS right now. Uh, so I again... I don't even think they know what they're doing with the stimulus money, whether or not it's going to be taxable. Correct. I mean, all taxes for this year. Correct. So it, it's still an unknown. Sorry, we can't it answer. It is an unknown. 
Okay, so what about students who are currently in default? Will they uh, qualify for the, the funds? When you go back to eligible students, a student that's eligible in default is not eligible. Okay. Unless they meet one of the conditions, you know, that, that puts them no longer uh, ineligible. But it, you, there's a whole list in the handbook of what's eligible for students and what isn't as far as default status. But again, you don't get those codes if you don't file a FAFSA. You can check to see if they're in default on an SLDS. Okay, and it looks like we're getting a lot of questions in regards to the SEOG, um, needing like a little bit more clarification on that. Um, I hope it's not stuff we're still waiting for clarification on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm seeing something here. If we don't have the issue with matching the SE SEOG, then the student won't get the funds they were awarded. No, when you award the students, you award the student what you want to give them. So if you want to get a total of $200, you award them $200. In the software you put that you want $200, you don't put any institutional match, you've let us know um, you know, that you, you're going to discontinue doing institutional match, or I'm not sure how we're handling that. I think we're assuming you don't want to continue to match, although there may be some schools that do want to match. If you decide you don't want to match, you have to remember your total number of students you're going to award is going to decrease because now you're using 100% of funds. Okay. So, like, if you were able to award 400 students before at X amount and only 75% of it was federal money, that's now going to reduce the total number of students you're going to get because 100% of it's federal funds. Great, thank you. And I have one last question here. We're in the process of being approved for the temporary online education, but we need to know what the minimum hours per week for a part-time study program is within the state. Also, do they need to maintain the same schedule of classes according to the contract? I think I asked that question earlier. You did, but I didn't think I don't think I answered the contract portion. I think it depends on who you're with. And uh, I know originally Dr. Miranda had mentioned that they couldn't change their contract, but if you don't change your contract, the end of your contract period is going to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And there's of other things, I think you have to make an adjustment to it. Also, if we don't know in the system, if we're doing an IS system for you, what the student's current schedule is, we're not going to know if they're less than full, at least less than uh, half time, and then they're going to get paid incorrectly. So I think you have to change the schedule. SAT progress won't be correct if you don't change the schedule because they won't be making progress. That schedule affects a lot of things. So I think they're going to have to, but I would check with your accrediting agency and make sure they are in agreement with what I'm saying. All right, great. Thank you so much for the information that you guys provided today. You're, you're welcome. Thank you, Crystal, for your help. Tom, thank you so much for your insight. It's always wonderful. Um, we're going to do another webinar next week. Uh, I think we're going to try for Tuesday at 1. That one will be the update on what's happening, and we'll also cover some Title IX. And I'll see if we can get a guest speaker for then. What do you think, Tom? Do you think we can get somebody? I'll try. Um, I've got one in mind. If you, you know, I was thinking Chris DeLuca, unless you think we could maybe get Jim. Uh, that's the one I was going to try. I figured so much. So uh, stay tuned, and we hope to see you next Tuesday. Again, we appreciate you being here with us every week. Everybody stay safe and well. Bye. Bye.